Hey there, friends. I hope you're having a good week. Um, <laughs> in all honesty, I'm not. I'm feeling pretty low. Um, and, uh, I never know how much to talk about this stuff, but, <clears throat> you know, and it's, it's personal in its way, but I'm sort of honestly really devastated by the, um, the results of the election this week. And, uh, that's sort of where I've been struggling as a, uh, you know, as a gay person, as a gay American, I am really nervous about what this means for the future. But as an empathetic human being, I'm, I'm more concerned generally. So for anyone out there who is feeling as I am right now, uh, you know, as, as an ally, I want to say that I am not going to be silent when women or African Americans or Black Americans or Latino Americans or Chinese Americans or anyone is um, being targeted or unfairly, uh, I don't know, accused of unfairness, I guess. But um, yeah, I don't know. I don't want to dwell on it. I sort of <laughs> have been dwelling on nothing but, but Let's do a video. Um, I've actually been doing some readings for myself about the, you know, process of of moving through life when things outside of our control kind of have such a strong effect on them. And uh, one card keeps appearing in the reading, which is the Three of Swords, and sort of concurrent with that a few days ago, um, Jace, Jason, um, one of the folks who subscribes to this channel and comments a lot and um, asks a lot of great questions. Um, had a couple of requests for videos and one of them was sort of a uh, uh, talking about the cards themselves and in terms of meanings and he said I know there are a lot of videos out there like that but I'd like to hear what you have to think and I thought well how do I do about how do I do that in a way that's different or maybe interesting and, and maybe this won't be interesting to everybody but um, that's okay. Hopefully, you know, if you are interested, you'll stick with it. And if you're not interested, there's lots of other things to watch. Um, what I thought I would do is kind of a series of ruminations on the cards by suit. And just kind of talk through how generally I experience them. Or I've, how I've come to experience them. Um, and I'm starting with the suit of swords because it sort of represents the cycle of states I've experienced in the last few days. It's, you know, and the Three of Swords keeps coming up. Um, and I think the thing about the Three of Swords sometimes is it, especially in, in its repeated appearances, is that sometimes we just have to feel the unpleasant things we're feeling. But I don't necessarily view the Swords as an entirely unpleasant suit, although it is one of the more difficult suits. Um, so I I hope that you enjoy what I'm about to do and, and that you share your thoughts and... Um, that you're that you're good I you know I want to send whatever positive energy I can out to the world right now because I feel like the world needs it um so let's talk about the suit of swords and um in terms of our attributions um you know we know that the suit of swords represents air and air uh in my humble opinion and in the humble opinion of others maybe in the not so humble opinion of others the air um, is associated with the mind and with the intellect and with communication and words and writing and uh, speaking and saying. And my company used to have a slogan that I, I kind of liked, which was this, I this idea that everything communicates, we used to say. And what we meant is that whatever you're saying or not saying, whatever you're doing or not doing, is communicating to our customers in this case in a corporation about about the about the company but it's true in life you know um i remember talking to a friend you know i'm a writer i'm a playwright and um i remember talking to a friend who uh you know we were just moaning as writers do and uh i said you know, I just, I hate it when people don't say anything after they see something you've written. 
And she said, yeah, it's it's nice to get feedback from people. And I said, well, yeah, but like not saying anything is feedback. You know, like silence is as much feedback as I hated it or I loved it because it's saying in a way I, I don't either care enough to tell you what I thought or I'm afraid to tell you what I thought, you know? So um, everything does communicate and the suit of swords kind of expresses communication in a way. I think this is a suit about writing uh, as a writer. I think it's a suit about thinking. And I know I've talked about my anxiety issues in the past. So this is a suit that is interesting to me because I think a lot of the cards capture that experience of living in, in the world with chronic and sometimes crippling anxiety. Um, I've managed that anxiety over the years in different ways, including with um, prescriptions. But you still are affected in a way when you're when your brain is that active. The um, suit of swords to me in a way is sort of what happens when the magician is unable to control the energy in his mind sometimes. So um, it's an interesting suit and it has some unpleasant associations, but it also has some really interesting ones. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the cards, uh, and I'm just going to use four decks as visual aids. Um, these are four decks that I feel like have a nice cross-section of styles, and they're popular enough that people have them. Um, and uh, one is the Universal Weight, which is the Weightsmith deck I use most. This is the Fountain Tarot, this is the Ellis deck, and this is the Wild Unknown. So... Here is a sort of walking tour through the suit. So again, um, it's about it's about intellect. It's about communication. It's about the messages we send and receive. It's about what we think and how we think. It's about how what we think makes us feel. Um, because I think a lot of physical and emotional states actually start in the mind. So the Ace of Swords to me really represents an idea. It's sort of the light bulb going on. The Ace of Swords to me is kind of like an epiphany, a realization. It's it's the the coming together or the formation of a thought, and um, I think that it's interesting because it is such a powerful image. The way that a thought can kind of cut through everything, a good idea, a moment of genius, the light bulb coming on. It it is sort of like a sword cutting through. So I think it's I think it's interesting. It's it's like brainstorming. It's it's being awed or or in wonderment of something. Then the the negative thing, the negative association of these cards of the ace, um, can sometimes be conservative conservatism or resistance to new ideas. Um, it can sort of be a regressive thought. It can be writer's block. It can be being stumped, or it could be refusing to engage in an argument or a discussion over something that is important and something that matters. So the Ace of Swords um, is an interesting card to me in that way because it really does sort of slice through a reading in that way. So I'm move these away. The Two of Swords is in a way a very sort of nebulous card because it's so similar in a lot of ways to the two of pentacles. You know, there's definitely a sort of sense of balance and, and juggling. When I started reading, this card was often associated with sacrifice, which I thought was interesting. To me, it, it can do with choice. It can be to do with the idea of weighing two choices, being torn by choice. Um, it also, to me, represents analysis which is what we're doing when we're making a choice. So the Two of Swords can represent a state of analyzing or a state of evaluating. That, I think, is really interesting. It can be meditation. The Rider Waite image, of course, is a very iconic one. And to me, this sort of represents a meditative state. And again, we're dealing with the mind. We're dealing with air, with the intellect. It can have a sense of kind of going internal and going into silence. Um, Kabbalistically, twos are associated with wisdom. And so in that way, I think the two of swords, because the swords represent the mind, 
kind of most fully embody that Kabbalistic association because we're talking about the suit of air, we're talking about intellect and communication. So it really strongly embodies the idea of wisdom, of making a wise choice, of going internal to think about the choice, making a well-balanced, analyzed choice. Um, then there's also the idea of sort of practice. Um, there's an idea in sports of deep practice, and that involves kind of breaking something down to its, you know, most tiny element. You don't, you know, you don't practice swinging the baseball. You break the swing down into stance and then into sort of lead off and then into follow through. Um, and you, you break it down and you practice each section, each small bit, um, until it becomes second nature and you don't have to think about it, whether it's baseball or whether it's, um, baking a pie crust, you know what I mean? You practice mixing the ingredients. You don't roll out the whole thing. You just practice getting the right balance of flour and butter and shortening and water. Um, my pie crust includes vodka, by the way. Um, so that's sort of the positive concepts of the Two of Swords. It can also be studying, uh, in my opinion, or sort of concentrating, again, very internal in that way. Then there's also the negative associations. So for me, the negative association of the Two of Swords can be this idea of analysis paralysis, which is that we get stuck in an analytical mode and we become unable to make a decision. We get stuck in our mind, stuck in our head, and we get stuck in the idea phase to the point where we can't actually make any decisions or the ideas never come to life. So those are my ruminations there on the twos, of on the two of swords. The three of swords is <laughs> a visitor this week, and I talked about this just a moment ago. Um, sometimes it symbolizes, especially when it comes up, the idea that though we want to move past pain, we can't rush things. We have to experience it. I've talked about this in a few other videos before, but there's a song in the musical, The Music Man, and uh, it's called The Sadder But Wiser Girl for me. And I think about this card sometimes as representing a sadder but wiser state, which is representative of how I'm feeling in life right now. That, you know, recognizing something, seeing the reality of something, learning something, means that we we can't unknow what we know. Once we know something, we can't unlearn it. We can't unknow it. We can't unsee what we've seen. So it does make us smarter to learn, but it also makes us sadder, you know, because we lose we lose a state of ignorance. And in a way, it's the concept of the you know the allegory of Adam and Eve. You know, once they eat from the tree, they can't unknow what they know. They can't unsee what they've seen. And they can't go back to that state of innocence. They can't go back to Eden. And that's partly what this card represents to me. Um, Kabbalistically, threes represent understanding. And that's interesting to me, you know, because once we understand reality, or once we see reality, we can't unsee it. We can't un-understand something. Our perceptions can change. We can learn new things. But once we have sort of a revelation, once that Ace of Swords energy comes... Um, once we know something, we can't unknow it. And so I think the Three of Swords talks about that. Also, the the Wild Unknown deck is the one I've been using mostly. This is not my favorite. This is one of the few cards in the deck where I feel like I wish it had a more traditional imagery because the way that the other decks picture it as a heart being pierced, I think a lot of people associate that with heartbreak. And I, I certainly read the card that way, but there's also this shoving together of the heart and the mind because the sword represents mind. So it's like the it's like the bashing together of our hearts and our minds, which sometimes can be really good. You know, it can be really an interesting collision when we're thinking and feeling the same things. But it can also be painful and it can also be difficult. Um, and our mind can lead our hearts into negative directions. And our hearts can sometimes lead our minds into negative directions and positive directions. So there's this interesting coming together in the three of the heart and the mind. Um, and the inability to unsee or unknow what we know. Um, 
So more traditional definitions that I, I have in my journal include loss, heartbreak, unrequited affections. But I like to really focus on the element and the suit. So yes, loss, heartbreak, yeah, but those are more emotional and what we're dealing with is more intellectual, right? Or communication in the suit of swords. So this is where a lot of the traditional interpretations of the three of swords kind of get out of sync to me with the numerology and the elemental association. So things that are important to me are the idea of using words to wound, you know? So we have communication that hurts, susceptibility to being wounded by the words of others. So we're very sensitive to language, um, the impressions of others. It could indicate mental abuse, you know, if, if that were something we were seeing in a reading. Um, if we're a creative person, and this could indicate the feelings of a bad review or a harsh judgment. Um, sometimes I think about this card as that feeling of mortality we experience when we fall in love, you know. I feel like sometimes when we do fall in love and we, we sort of realize how mortal we are, how much we stand to lose when we realize what we have, then there's also the concept of imagined pain. There's the concept of something hurting so good, you know, I've talked about that in others. Um, and then there's the symbology just of this, you know, it looks like the sacred heart, so... There's something in there, too, that's interesting. Um, so that's the three, and it's a card that's really sort of sticking its head out to me right now in a lot of ways. So it's an interesting one. I really like the idea of associate, of keeping the, the elemental association. So while stereotypically this card represents heartbreak, we can't let go of the fact that we're talking about intellect. We're talking about communication in the mind. So... Yeah, heartbreak, but heartbreak caused by thinking or communication. Uh, and again, that sort of mashing together of the heart and the mind um, and how sometimes that can be really beautiful. I think the Three of Swords and the Fountain Tarot is really beautiful. It doesn't, it's not a painful idea. And this is a very swordsy deck in a way. But then there's a more painful concept. Well, you know, even in Waite Smith, it's not that painful a look. Uh, a lot of modern decks make it look really ugly. Um, Ellis doesn't, um, but it does have a drama there. So anyway, that's the three. The four is a card I really sort of like because it it feels restful. Um, it feels like the mind at ease in a lot of ways. The Wild Unknown is interesting because while it, you get that sense of meditation and, you know, the, the card has the sort of... Um, glow coming from the lamb's mind there's something in here about swords and a lamb that makes me think of you know a sacrificial lamb but um kabbalistically fours are mercy and um there's something merciful in rest there's something merciful in the mind stopping um i'm not a huge true blood fan for no other reason than it's just not my my taste but um there's something interesting in the the early stories of of Suki and and Bill and that when she's with him she can't hear what everyone's thinking and there's rest in that you know or she can't hear what he's thinking and then there's restful there's like a merciful rest in not having to think or process information and to me that's sort of what the four of swords feels like so um it can be rest it can be retreat again it can have an element of meditation the way the two can um it can be giving up on an argument or choosing to sit an argument out, you know, picking your battles. I think there's something interesting and very mature about choosing to do that in life. Uh, rejuvenating, it can be sleep or recovery. Um, it can be the wisdom to know when not to say something uh, or knowing when to stay still. Um, conscientious objection, too. Um, now, the converse of that, the more negative... Um, interpretations of the card can be that it's laziness or a lack or willingness or unwillingness to communicate or an inability to communicate or a refusal to kind of engage on something that's important. Um, it can be not knowing when to shut up or not knowing when to rest and stay still. So I think that that card is interesting too. Well, I keep saying that. They're all interesting. The five is always interesting. Um, in a weird way, I'm always reading 
the Waitsmith card when I'm t thinking about the Five of Swords, regardless of what the energy of the card is. And they're, you know, they're all very similar. Um, so we're almost, I don't think many people have found a better way to depict the Five. Um, the Wild Unknown is really interesting. This is why a lot of people feel scared of the Wild Unknown deck, because the imagery is so different. But actually, I feel like you do get an energy that's similar here. With the five, again, um, you have conflict, but I feel like we can't forget the suit assignment. We can't forget the air element. So um, it's not just about conflict. I think, I think that there's an element of debate to it. Uh, so I think, you know, it can be winning an argument or a debate, having the upper hand in an argument or debate. Um, it can, you could look at it as taking the higher ground, particularly when you look at the way that the um, Fountain Tarot depicts it, because there's the sort of stilt quality to it. So the higher ground, um, it can be simply just being better prepared or equipped with the skill or the, the knowledge behind something. Um, it can be using words to win instead of action. So kind of a pen is mightier than the sword attitude. Um, it can involve arguments being settled, particularly where one party is happier than the other. So, you know, not everyone gets what they want, not everyone gets a trophy. So the five can be about an argument that gets settled um, where one person's happier. But there, there's definitely a sense of sort of someone coming out on top. The pen is mightier than the sword is something I really think is interesting there. Um, then there's sort of the negative, which is feeling vanquished or being bettered by someone who's just better prepared or a better match. You know, sometimes we're going to engage in conflicts in life where we're not the most well-prepared. Or sometimes we're going to be the most well-prepared and we're going to lose anyway. So there's that in there. Um, it's a failure to study, a failure to be prepared, um, or attempting to solve something with wit that really needs action. Is how I've come to see this card, too. The Wild Unknown is interesting because there's a regenerative aspect to it because, of course, you know, the, the card depicts this worm being sliced in two, but, of course, it would it would regenerate. Um, so it's not just sort of a vanquishment or a winning, but sort of a regenerative element to it, too, which I think is interesting. I keep using that word. I hate the word interesting. It's one of my least favorite descriptors in life. The six... It's such a gentle card in so many ways. I remember a friend telling me that after her um, husband passed on, um, she had a young child and she went to a reader and she got this card and it sort of knocked her down. Um, so it can mean moving, um, which is a very sort of fortune telly kind of thing, which is fine. But again, I like to keep my associations really close to the suit association. So... Um, Oh, by the way, just this, you may have this already, but um, five Kabbalistically is, is strength, and you definitely get a sense of strength there. So six Kabbalistically is beauty, and there's something so beautiful in this image to me of moving forward, of moving beyond. I love the steampunk quality to the Ellis deck. Whoops. Um... There's, there's very few representations of this card that I don't like. Um, everyone knows the weight. Even this has the energy of moving forward. So when I see the Six of Swords, I do think about moving on. I do think about moving on after loss. Um, there's something there about maybe seeking asylum. So sometimes I think about refugees. Um, then I get into my suit association, and there's something about letting the mind drift or daydreaming. Or using thought to escape from a bad situation. So there's something in there about letting the mind drift away, letting the mind move. Daydreaming, fantasizing, sort of intellectually planning a move. Um, travel writing. Again, we're talking about communication and the swords. Uh, there was a deck, and I wish I still had it, that the swords, pseudo swords, were pens. And I've always loved that association. So travel writing carrying thoughts or memories wherever you go, um, fantasizing travel, being a tour guide, um, so guiding others on a journey. So there's a sort of mentorship here. There's also maybe a little bit of a sense of guided meditation in this card. Um, now more negative associations sometimes are the inability to move forward, the inability to leave loss behind, the inability to sort of mentally travel or, or think. It could be a lack of focus an inability to focus on a thought, 
feeling scattered mentally. Um, or moving on and not letting go, which is a little bit more of a stereotypical definition. Um, but that's the six. The seven is always a fun card too. I have this was one of those cards I always had a really hard time um, reading when it when it came out. I love the look on the fox's face in that deck, and even the the dude's face in the a waitsmith. Um, what I really like about decks like these two are that the hand is touching the blade, which I think is it's just such a subtle thing, but I feel like it's so important. Um, sort of repelling in this case, very like steampunk um, Mission Impossible. Anyway, um, stealing, certainly, there's definitely a sneaky aspect to this, but um, again, a lot of people really love this card and have, have um, reclaimed it from its traditionally negative interpretations. So um, I think it can be survival tactics. I think it can be strategizing mystery even i think there's definitely craftiness sharpness um you know um mental agility thinking on your feet that's what this card is about for me you could have a political operative in this card you know sort of a spin doctor there's something in there um interestingly i think you know you could get a sense of of, again, if we think about stealing, sure, but again, assigning it to the suit is always interesting to me because when you take sort of stereotypical definitions and then you force them to live in the element, stealing, stealing what? Well, we're talking about intellect, we're talking about communication. So there we get this idea of like intellectual property theft, like pirating videos or movies, um, plagiarism, things like that, which are really interesting, thought crimes you know, could be really an interesting interpretation of the card. Sowing the seeds of doubt in others or manipulating them. Um, conspiracy, conspiracy theories, or even memory loss or identity theft. Um, so there's a lot in this card that that's interesting. I keep using that word, damn it, stop, stop saying that. <laughs> um, so the Seven of Swords is an interesting, interesting card. And I did it again. <laughs> I do that. Oh my god. I hate when people describe things as interesting because it's such, you know, earlier I used that example of like feed not saying anything is feedback, silence is feedback. Well, interesting is feedback, you know. When someone says, "Oh, that's interesting." It's it's like either it's so uninteresting to them they can't even be bothered to think of something to say or that they hated it, you know what I mean? There's the if you if you're a, you know, a classic movie nerd like I am, there's that great moment in Amadeus where Salieri has his opera and, and um, Mo he asks Mozart what he th thought of it and Mozart says, you know, one hears such sounds and one can only say Salieri. You know, it's, a, it's such shade. You know, he totally throws shade. And that's what interesting to me is. Anyway, the Eight of Swords. Um, by the way, Seven Kabbalistically is victory. So, um... There's definitely a sense in there of kind of like a spoils of war, too. Um, eight is splendor. And that's not necessarily a, a word you associate with this card, right? So I think that's really fascinating. Um, again, I associate, I make an association with this card and the suit of air and the intellect. And so what I get a sense of here is being stuck in one's head which if you are a hyper-intellectual person or someone who's prone to anxiety, you know that feeling. So you really can get trapped in your own mind. And that's why I think the card is so frequently depicted with this with this wrapping um, index. It can be frequently sort of loosely bound. Um, I don't, I didn't choose any decks that kind of have that, although the spider web is a very delicate thing. Um, so being trapped in your mind, being trapped in a verbal or emotional assault, um, being stuck or stagnated, needing a fresh point of view. I think there can be something here about being stuck in a dogma or being trapped by a dogma. So if you feel trapped by a belief, that can really keep you stagnated. I think words, sort of a tongue lashing or being tongue-tied or speechless. Um, 
this is the section of the suit of swords where we start getting into anxiety and the eight nine and ten for me are the trilogy of anxiety um and i talked about this in one of the few um live chats i've been on with um the truth and story with kelly from the truth and story i, I mentioned that the nine eight nine ten of swords are like the initial trickling of the fear and then the takeover of the fear and then being completely obliterated by fear and anxiety the eight nine ten so there's something in that trilogy um that that feels anxious to me i don't always interpret it in that way but i do frequently um so being tongue-tied speechless bound by fear um there's also something in refusing to flee when you should you know refusing to get out of a situation you might want to get out of um but again you know there's there's interesting layers here beyond that so um this could be a magical escape from something or an escape act it could be an act um an illusion of being trapped or using this as a way to get something um writing adult fiction writing kinky fiction um because again there's the sort of bound aspect and you know pens or swords um so you know you could this could be a recommendation to spice things up by reading or writing you know some erotic novels or stories um or telling them um uh, i think that um you can also free yourself in this card and you can free yourself with your wisdom or your thought or your intellect um you know and again it, it could indicate um a, a predilection for fetishes so it's an interest it's fascinating everything about tarot is fascinating the reason why i hate that i keep repeating that is because it's it goes without saying but and it sounds pretentious that i'm calling my own interpretations or my own you know evolution of interpretations fascinating or interesting and it's just vapid and i don't like that so we get the nine. Oh, let me go back to kabbalistic interpretations here for a sec um splendor I've never really managed to reconcile this, um, except there is kind of a beauty in in being stuck sometimes. Um, there is kind of a, um, gosh, I don't know how to describe it. I, I guess there's a transformative, and, that, and that's one reason why I really like this version of the eight, because it is literally a cocoon. And so there's the sense of going inside and transforming. Um, and so sometimes we do have to, we do have to go up and, you know, we have to sort of start with that two and four, two, four, eight. And so in the, the two, we go inside in the four, we stay there and we, we really meditate. Um, in the six, we sort of journey in that mental state. And then in the eight, we kind of achieve a certain transformative moment and we can't go back to the way things were. I don't know. I, I just think it's interesting. I'm not super well versed in Kabbalah and tarot. I've been doing a lot of reading lately on it just because I I have I've kind of run out of books. Um and I'm I'm actually reading books on Kabbalah that aren't related to tarot because I felt like I wanted to start with the original Hebrew um I, I don't read Hebrew, but the original Judaism um and see where all of this came from because in a way Kabbalah and tarot, like tarot's use of Kabbalah comes from, eso, you know, Christian esotericism. It is in its way cultural appropriation, but it does seem to fit really well. Um, so I'm, I'm just exploring that. And I think that that's one thing we should keep doing is explore. So the nine, uh, nines Kabbalistically are foundation. Um, so again, an interesting thing I haven't quite been able to reconcile with this, um, with the suit of swords so um except that a lot of our the foundation of a lot of our actions can be fear-based or a lot of our inaction can be fear-based so and the nine is very much a card for me about fear um again i talked about panic the nine to me is the quintessential panic attack um nightmares insomnia being stalked by fear or anxiety living with anxiety i also feel like there's something to be said for this card representing gaslighting you know, if you've ever heard that expression, kind of emotionally manipulating someone to believe things that aren't true so that they stay um, or do things for you. Um, 
so there, there's something in that I think um, it's not a happy card you know and it's not a tr it's not a card that translates into happy things um, but there are places you can go with this um, so it, it can in some context mean the release of fear or the moving away from fear depending on what's around it um, I, again to tie it into intellect and, and creativity it could mean writing horror fiction you know so uh, if, if you're looking at this and it's an advice card and you're a creative person and you get the nine of swords like maybe it's time to explore some uh, darker fiction or some darker paintings or some darker music some minor tones you know some um, really plumbing the depths you know Stephen King talks about the fact that when he writes he writes what scares him and that's how he manages to scare so many people. Um, so there's something in that. The 10 is kind of the culmination to me of fear. Um, when you have had panic attacks and real panic attacks, um, I'm not trivializing people who say they've had them, but I feel like people say they're having a panic attack um, without ever having experienced the real deal. Um, when you have had a real panic attack, it's, um, it, it feels like this card does. You feel spent. You feel like you're dead. Uh, it feels like the whole world is crashing in around you. And it's all in your head. And to me, that's what this card embodies, is the way our mind can destroy us sometimes. Um, it can absolutely devastate our our sense of worth our sense of humanity so um if you've ever had a situation where your self-esteem has been really low or you have a tendency to kind of you know do that abusive self-talk thing i think the ten of swords embodies that in a way um i think it can also be slander or gossip i think it can be about imagining the worst um because again, we're talking about the mind, so it, it can be kind of a, a chronic or acute pessimism. Um, I can, I think it can be thinking things to death, you know, analyzing like the two I talked about analysis paralysis, thinking about it and thinking about it and obsessing over it and obsessing over it until it is completely beaten to death. Um, it could be the kinds of fights or comments that can end relationships. You know, so it's that kind of thing where you you say the thing that shatters the relationship. You know, there there could be that in there. Um, it could be over doing an argument or arguing the same thing over and over again. Um, there is, to me, a sense of melodrama in this card, too. So um, that's a card. This is a card that I've always thought about. It's like... It, because, you know, some people don't see it, and I get it, but, like, it takes one sword to kill somebody. We've got ten. You know what I mean? So it's, like, so overdramatic. It's so... Like, it's just been, like... We get it. You know what I mean? It is mellow drama. Just, you know, deluxe. Um, being fatalistic. Um, it could be being or feeling stabbed in the back. I talked about self-worth. Um, it can be depression. It can be just things that are out of our control that we want to control. Um, I've heard people describe this as a card of acupuncture or alternate therapy. Um, it can be the passing of depression. It can be dawn breaking, which we get sort of in the weight and the fountain tarot. Um, it can be sort of the, the prickling feeling of lots of ideas, of a brainstorm of information, too. So... Um, yeah, that's the 10. Is it interesting? Sure, why not? Interesting. Interesting. I couldn't decide whether to do the pages, uh, the courts rather, all together or within their suits. But I think I'm because I have them here, I'm just going to keep going with the pages. I mean, with the, the courts. Um, the reason why I, I would do them together is because they actually have a completely different system for me. Um uh, so I think about them as evolutions of um, of a journey. And so the page is the student. The knight is kind of the seeker. 
uh, the hunter. The queen is the nurturer and the embodiment, and the king is the master, the guru. So, but you can you can interpret them on their own as well. So, with a page of swords, I typically think about a student, really a young one, probably maybe an undergrad or someone who's young and smart, someone who's new to something but really adept at it, who has like a um, an instinct for it, a savant, you know, kind of a young genius. Someone who's like new to writing or a young writer, again, because of the association of air, a beginner. Um, someone who's drawn to communication or writing as a career, but who isn't, or even psychology, but who hasn't sort of started down that path yet, but who's discovering that interest. I think the 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 knights kind of discover an interest in their suit. The knights sort of, uh, the pages, I'm sorry, the pages sort of say, oh, I never thought about that before. I'm kind of curious about this. You know, so the, the pages have a curiosity about, about their suit. Um, so it could be someone at the start of a career in those areas, journalism. Um, you know, it could even be someone who's just starting out delivering mail because the pages are, are messengers and the swords are words or communications. So, so there's that association. Um, the more negative aspect of the page I had a teacher once say, there's no expert like a novice. And I feel like the negative aspect of the page is that. It's like you when you just start out with something and you feel like you're ready to go out and teach it. You know, I, mean? I, you know, I read one book on this topic, so obviously I'm going to go teach a course in it. Where you kind of feel like you, um, you know, you know it all after you barely know anything. Or what, what's another thing that happens with, with novices is that they're so ashamed of being novices that they are afraid to admit it and they want to sort of produce a wisdom that they're not capable of yet. But that, you know, we have to allow ourselves to be students of things. One of the biggest mistakes I ever made in my life when I was younger was letting that get in the way of learning new things. The ability, the, the, the terror of being found out as a novice, um, stopped me from ever doing some things I wanted to do. So, um, there's definitely a negative aspect to that. Um, it can be a smug beginner or an arrogant newbie, you know, someone who's sort of smarmy about, about learning. Um, it could be someone who's really bright, but inexperienced and who just refuses to, to engage in their potential. Um, also it could indicate a learning disability. The Knight of Swords, uh, to me, could be like a grad student or an emerging artist, an emerging writer, um, a young sort of political wonk, you know, an analytical kind of young person. Um, you know, that stereotype of the hot nerd could fall into this category, too. There's something sexy about the knights, where, you know, stereotypically male, but male or female, I don't, though the, knight, the, the, the courts are gendered, I don't view them as one sex or another. And so, you know, sort of the knight can be your hot nerd. Um, someone who's green, but like eager to learn, you know, a little bit of a genius, kind of a minor genius or an immature genius. Definitely a go-getter. Um, maybe an investigative journalist or an investigative reporter or a detective. Someone who sort of searches for information. A cop, you know, a rookie maybe. Um, or a headhunter, a recruiter, you know, someone who goes out and looks for talent. Um... The negative, uh, sort of the shadow of the night is someone who's smart but inept, or they don't have common sense, or they can't deal with other people's ignorance, so they can't suffer fools to the point where, you know, they can't be, excuse me, they can't be around anyone. Um, someone who pretends to know more than they do, um, someone who's pretentious, or who just sort of thinks that at the beginning of their career they should be given, you know, the CEO position, um, and someone who's pre preoccupied with status over experience. Um, so what they really care about is the title, not earning it or learning it. So that's the negative side of the the Knight of Swords. The Queen of Swords. Queens? I resisted this, this word for so long when it came to the Queen because I honestly felt like it was sexist. But I've come around on it purely because I can't find a better one. The queens nurture the element of their suit. They bring it to life. They embody it. Um, and uh, that's what the queen is. But again, it doesn't need to be a woman. This, this is the hard thing about reading tarot for me, especially as um, a gay person, is that I, I hate the gender stereotypes. Um, but I've learned to kind of move past them. And in fact, with The Wild Unknown, we get mother-daughter 
father and son. So it's, you know, and that's the deck I'm using most. So we all have mother qualities. We all have father qualities. Um, so, you know, I, I try to move past it. So the queen of swords, um, for me could be, um, like a political operative, um, CJ Craig from the West Wing, you know what I mean? That kind of smart, sharp, um, funny, witty, brilliant mind, you know what I mean? Who's, who's captivating. Um, uh, or Kay Graham, you know, I'm using women in this case because I, when I made my notes, I was thinking particularly about women, which I guess is sexist of me, right? Um, uh, someone who works in the field of communication, someone who maybe leads a communications, maybe a tastemaker or an influencer of style, a speechwriter, um, really sharp-willed, really smart, someone who does not take prisoners, someone who does not take BS, um, could be someone who works in a college administrative or like deanship, um, maybe a writing or communications professor, uh, maybe a trainer, a corporate trainer. Um, so that kind of um, really, really, really sort of smart, smart person whose job is to help others achieve smarts too, or get information. Um, the negative side of the queen the king and the queen of swords to me can be very standoffish. They have a tendency to put up barriers. So there's something really in the king and queen of swords. They're hard to get close to. Sometimes because they're so witty or so smart, they can be intimidating to a fault. Or they can just be someone who has a hard time connecting with other people. Um, they could be um, sort of people who maybe exist on the spectrum. Because they're so cerebral, they have a hard time um, connecting at an emotional level. Um, you know, those of us who live in our heads have a tendency to do that. Um, so there's that. Um, it can be someone who sacrificed everything to achieve status and who sort of looks around and says, oh, this is all there is. Um, it can be someone who experiences regret about the way they've gone about things. Um, there's a hardness or maybe a meanness, a meanness, sort of a wit that can wound. There's always this sort of um, state of grief, too, with the with the queen, um, which I read about a long time ago, but that's always stayed with me. So she can be sort of a solitary and, and grieving presence sometimes. She can sort of be prone to depression or sadness. So, Like the king. The king has that quality, too. He can be remote as a result of feeling kind of hurt by life. Um, so finally, the King of Swords. Again, this can be your politician, your president, your debater, your CEO, the face of an organization, the head of a school, the president of a college, say. Uh, again, we're talking about someone who's a communicator, someone who's an intellectual, someone who uh, is a writer. So, you know, you, you've you got your master, your your brilliant, right, your Tony Morrisons or your Faulkners, you know what I mean? Um, uh, a military leader, potentially, um, because again, swords are weapons. So, you know, you could look at the, the court of swords as people in the military, the king in particular. Um, it could be one of those sort of Edward R. Murrow types, like a really master journalist. Um, someone in intelligence, like a spy, um, you could have a, a, this person as a doctor or a surgeon or a machinist. Um, but there's a battle weary quality to the king too. You know, he's seen it, he's done it. And you, again, like I talked about with the three, you can't unsee what you've seen. You can't unknow what you know. And the king wouldn't really be worn out by that. Um, he can be sort of a personality assassin. He could be your sort of Joseph McCarthy type. Um, who uses position and, w and wit and intellect to, to hurt and destroy reputations. Um, the king and queen are interesting. I almost always sort of read them in their most positive formation, but, um, you know, there, there's shadow sides to everything. You know, where it's hard to find something positive to say about the nine and the ten, it's hard to say something necessarily negative about the kings and the queens, but, you know, they're, they're fully rounded um, personality types. Uh, and so they do have their downsides, and the king and queen definitely do. And the nine and the ten have a potential um, positive side, too, as we talked about. There is a lightning of experience. There is a creative energy to those. 
Um, you know, and, and what I didn't talk about, um, Kabbalistically, the ten represents kingdoms, so it's sort of the ultimate embodiment of the suit. Um, and so, ignoring the image for a second, the, the ten of swords can be the full complement of mental and communication skill. Um, you know, and, and sometimes we have to ignore the image on the card. As much as we're um, influenced by it, sometimes we have to ignore it and go with our gut. Sometimes you're going to get the Ten of Swords in a really positive position, and you're going to have to say, why is this a good thing? Um, and I, I did a video on that, on loving the scary cards. But anyway, this is a long video, so I'm going to stop. I do hope that if you stayed with me during this, you enjoyed it. Um, it's fun to kind of talk about all this stuff. The question now becomes, like, especially when you're starting out and you're reading a lot about card descriptions or you're watching videos about card descriptions and card meanings, how to know when to reach for which description or which meaning. And I think one of the things that you have to do is trust your your skill and trust your mind and, and let the swords energy that you possess guide you a little bit. Um, so that when you do a reading, if you're looking at the Ten of Swords in a positive position, um, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Even if the first thing that comes to mind is loss, say, or pain. How can that be a good thing? How can pain be a good thing? Um, from pain we learn, you know? Um, you can tell a child not to touch the hot stove, but they're really going to remember not to touch the hot stove when they've touched it. You know, when, you know, as an, as someone who works in adult education as a corporate trainer and a, an instructional designer, um, I really try to get my trainers to encourage people to fail the tests because that helps us see what they've done wrong. And then we can coach them on how to do it better. And they're going to remember it because they had the brief moment of feeling crappy for having gotten it wrong or quote failing. Um, but then we can coach them on it and they're, they're going to remember it because they had that experience. Um, I have a friend whose sister, speaking of intellectuals, works in the neurology department uh, at a major, you know, Ivy League school. And um, my friend was sort of whining, as writers do, about failing. And her sister, the neurologist, said, you know, let me tell you how we think about failure in the lab. It's just data. It's just information. It tells us what didn't work. So we can try something else next time. We can't get to the cure until we try 100 things that don't work. And we need to narrow down what's not going to work. And you could look at the Ten of Swords that way you know, as, as learning from failure. So in that sense, yeah, you, you kind of fell on your face and it feels shitty as fuck. Gosh, that was really vulgar. It feels crappy. You know what I mean? But, um, you learned from it and you're not going to make that mistake again. And so, you know, all the cards have shades, I guess is the point. And how do you know? Well, you look at what's around them and you, you, you trust what you're learning and you, or you reach for the books um, you ask questions, uh, you journal about it. Um, and, and almost always deciding to say the first thing that pops in your mind when you see the 10 of swords is loss. Stay there with that and explore how that can be a good thing. You know what I mean? Um, especially when you're learning to trust your intuition. And if you're reading for someone else with you say, okay, loss is what I'm feeling here. Does that make sense? And they say, no, then, then you dialogue with them. Okay. How could, how could loss be a good thing? Or what do you lose? You know, getting this job means that you're, you're losing something else, you know? So you sort of dialogue with them and engage in it, but sort of work with that concept. Um, as you talk more, new things may come up and that's fine. You can go with those too, but don't necessarily, sweep away your first instinct is my point. So I, I said I was going to stop talking five minutes ago and I kept rambling. Um, anyway, I do hope you enjoyed this. I am going to do the other four suits and the majors. Uh, it's going to take me a while because uh, I'm traveling a bit in the next couple of days. But um, anyway, um, be well, be good, take care, be kind. And just, you know, I don't know. <laughs> Go, go through what needs to be gone through, I guess. Um, talk to you soon.